Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Yuzuru and from VD Lab in University of California, Davis, and my slide counts are irresponsibly ambitious, so I will go in right away. Uh, <laughs> so here we see a handsome chap exploring visualization to get uh, some information from a visualization or some sort of data. And uh, for those of you who are not really familiar with uh, visualization, uh, information visualization is a technology that graphically represents data to make information more understandable or cognitable for people who want to extract valuable knowledge from massive data. And currently there's a general assumption that we visualization designers, uh, develop, uh, developers uh, operate under that is becoming a growing concern to me and hopefully for the whole community. And what the, the general assumption when we design visualization is that we expect that the users are fully engaged in the visual data exploration. So when I say fully with quotation marks, uh, it's a vague definition. So in the paper, I describe uh, when the situation is a desktop application. And we can break down their engagement in, based on two uh, attributes, which is attention and participation. So for the attention, it's basically, is the user focused on the visualization or not so much? Uh, if the user is super focused on the visualization, it's focused. And if he's not focused on visualization, uh, it's periphery, meaning the visualization resides in the periphery of the user's view, uh, point of view. The participation is basically, is the user actively interacting or just uh, looking at the visualization without really actively interacting? So this, we define this uh, state as active or passive, meaning active, he is interacting actively, passive, he's not really interacting with the visualization. So when I say fully engaged, it's basically the user is super focused on the visualization, and the user is actively uh, interacting with the visualization to get some knowledge that he is intending to get. Um, but when we observe the actual ecosystem of how people treat visualizations, uh, this assumption does not always hold true. Uh, for example, this one is when the guy is actually focused. Uh, this example is actually when the guy is focused on the visualization. He's uh, focused and actively interacting, so the visualization takes a role similar to interactive visualization, which is the expected state. But when we keep on observing, uh, sometimes the uh, users will not be actively interacting and he will be just sipping on coffee and then checking updates on the visualization. So in this time, the user is, not, is focused on the visualization, but he's passively interacting, so he's not really actively interacting with the visualization which the visualization is supposed to take an animated visualization role instead of interactive visualization. And other times the user might be actually focused on his actual work and not the visualization. So he's not really trying to get information from the visualization, but maybe some notification or maybe he will glance at it every now and then, but he's not really focused either. So in this situation, it would be, uh, the visualization would be in the periphery of the user, and then he would be passively interacting, which in, in definition, it, the visualization takes over the role of ambient display, a system known as ambient display. Um, so this brings us to this uh, framework, which is practice. Basically, uh, when we collapse the degree of engagement from in one dimension and say low to high, uh, traditionally these different degrees of engagement were recognized but treated in separate verticals. So when you have a low degree of engagement, people are gonna develop uh, ambient display. If you have mid-range, meaning if you're not really gonna actively interact, then we would generate an animated visualization. And if it's like a super active super informative visualization, we're gonna have a very advanced interactive visualization. But as we've seen in the video, uh, a user can actually have different styles of engagement towards a visualization system, towards a single visualization system. 
So it doesn't really make sense to actually make a design these three different visualization systems just to support this guy's satisfaction or needs. So basically, our engagement versatile design, which is like a concept, uh, is to uh, recognize that these different modes of engagement all can exist uh, between a user and a single visualization. And therefore, we need to first consider uh, the different styles of engagement that we want, we want the visualization to support and then incorporate the different design principle exercise for these different types of systems to design a truly useful visualization. So basically in this example, we try to incorporate three different types of visualization uh, system or categories into a single uh, comprehensive visualization. And our example system is called StockLamp, which we use stock data. Um, it fit really well because people, not, people are not really interested in stock data 24-7, but they really want to know every, everything that's going to happen. So there's a lot of home uh, part-time investors, so we try to target that user. So I will give an example. There's a speaker. Uh, extreme awkwardness. Um, <laughs> I tried to put a demo and I thought that would be over ambitious, but the video seems to not work. Oh, maybe if I... Ah. So, <laughs> this is stock lamp. Uh, you can see it looks like a lava lamp. That's hence the name of stock lamp. <laughs> Um, there's uh, bubbles that represent uh, companies. Uh, we have seven companies, Intel, Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, all the tech companies that you might recognize. And then they're representing the stock value of, at that time, the market information. And then the representation is basically simple. The larger the bubble is, uh, the more transaction is happening. And then the color represents uh, whether the growth is positive or negative. And then the, the brightness of the bubbles indicate uh, are they receiving a lot of social attention. Uh, basically, we actually getting Twitter information also. So if there's a lot of twi tweets about the company on Twitter, then the bubble is going to be more brighter. And it all j works on real-time uh, data. Uh, so this is a lava lamp which is supposed to be super chilling and then relaxing. So it's supposed to support ambient display and then it updates information. So it would, if you're in fo uh, focus passive mode, which is like you're focused on the visualization and not really interacting, still should be entertaining and then very informative. And of course, if you want to dive in more detail, we have another it's, it's like a dual display. If you click on a certain bubble, it will bring up a view called InfoView, which we have uh, info cards that are like semi-interactive visualization and gives you more context about the uh, information of the chosen company. So you have tweets and related company, how they're doing. All information are based on online from Google Finance and Twitter. So of course we wanted to evaluate this system and then we had to generate a opponent system. So we made a system called Dashboard, which is here. Uh, basically we compile uh, each aspect of the data, which is the seven companies data into a single browser page and allow users to switch, uh, switch between uh, different attributes in tabs like here. And uh, basically we thought this is, well, we believe this is the default of how people actually view stock as a, if they keep in monitoring. If we see movies of stock traders, they have charts everywhere, so this should be it. Um, so we're gonna compare this and stock lamp. And then the user study, we collected 31 users with six females, student office workers and housewives and then the age range was from 23 to 34. 
and nobody was an experienced investor. And then the reason we chose the this demographic, the non-experienced investor, is basically we didn't want people who are already extensively trained to read stock charts uh, so that both visualization can be treated, I mean, treated in a fair manner. So the user, excuse me. So the user study has four steps. The step one is introductory tutorial, uh, online tutorial with easy exercise questions. We would, uh, we would explain the visualization and then check that they actually understood it uh, by giving some exercise questions and approximately takes about five minutes. We have a test session for each um, engagement mode and then for focus passive mode, we have a test session and the users were asked to just gaze at the visualization for one minute and then don't, in, without interacting and then respond to the following four questions, which is basically, which is the best growing company, which is the worst growing company, which company had the most transaction, which company had the least transaction. So pretty basic questions. And then we would compile this, uh, the correctness of the user into like, uh, minus 12 to 12 points. There's a scheme that we will compile and then give it a, a aggregated score, which range from minus 12 to 12. For the periphery passive test session, users were asked pretty much to do the same thing, but they were allowed to see, watch the visualization for two minutes, a little bit longer, and then while playing a game of whack-a-mole. So that's supposed to be their primary objective and then they're supposed to score highest as they can, and then while doing that, they should be receiving information from the visualization on the periphery. And then we asked the same exact question, and then we scored it in the same fashion. And for the focus active test, uh, we asked the users to explore and then do whatever they want with the visualization for three minutes, and then decide which company they want to invest more, and then which company they want to withdraw their investment. And then the question was a dummy question, and then the actual question was the afterwards, we actually asked them how, uh, how low, how task load, the, <laughs> how much load did they feel that, that this work required, that how much effort they required. So we used for NASA tasks load index to measure this, which is a range from one to 10, and then usually one meaning better and 10 meaning it was more effortful. And uh, I have results that I would like to share and I know you would like to know a lot, but these slides are just to show that I did my homework. Yeah? And <laughs> I think I should get to the findings, uh, which basically after all the statistics, which is in the paper, uh, we found out two major uh, findings. Uh, basically, stock lamp is an effective system for presenting information to users who are multitasking. This was actually a counter of what we actually found. Basically, when we measured uh, the focus passive and fo periphery passive mode and the stock lamp and dashboard, it, the, the dashboard basically, when people were not really playing, whack when people were playing whack-a-mole, the performance really went bad and then that indicating that, yeah, when you're multitasking, you're not going to perform well if you give them a generic solution for everybody who's focused. So in that way, Stock Lamp was very successful in giving a solution for people who want to multitask. And the second finding was users who are, who are able to effectively interpret the data presented by Stock Lamp also tend to find Stock Lamp easy to use for exploring and analyze stock data. Basically, this was from the NASA Task Load Index, and then we found, we didn't find that people, we found that people were uneven in general about how effort, how much effort it requires to uh, explore data on stock lamp or dashboard. But when we uh, separated people into two groups, with one group being the people who perform really well using stock lamp and people who perform better in dashboard, People who perform better in stock lamp showed that they had really uh, they had less effort in actually deciding the companies to invest, while people who perform better in dashboard had no indication of 
uh, which one is better or which one is not. So um, that's my presentation. I had a smashing video that I didn't find on the USB, so I put it on YouTube until somebody tells me off. Uh, you can search by there, and then it will give you more about how Stocklamp is implemented or, and whatnot. I would like to open up for questions. Thank you, Zero. Yes, we have time for questions. A couple of questions. Please use the microphone. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Jeffrey from uh, Je uh, City University of Hong Kong. Uh, just curious, uh, whether uh, this is an interesting application, I would say. And uh, I'm not sure if you have thought about uh, some outdoor display, like uh, interactive posters or something like that, where, where people may, sometimes they'll just come by and they're not so focused, and sometimes they just stand, up, stand there and focus, but not interacting, but sometimes they're interacting. So these modes, I, I think this framework is very interesting. I'm not sure whether you have thought about that before, because a lot of uh, interactive uh, outdoor display seems to suffer from this kind of problem, whether to be interactive or to be passive or that kind of thing. So what do you think about it? Yeah, um, actually it's very relevant. Um, there has been a very similar research done for public display, which actually categorized people's um, modes of engagement when the public display is uh, displayed. And then, it actually, is very similar to that uh, work. And um, basically, we believe that it doesn't really limit into public display, but also for desktop application, and even more relevant when the when we actually apply visualization to mobile devices, there would be a different ways of engaging with a mobile device application. But public display also definitely would benefit from a certain modality and a structural method of uh, designing these uh, applications, I, I believe. So, yeah, it very. I think it matches very well with public displays. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Eric Balmer, Cornell University. Um, <clears throat> I too thought the uh, sort of two-dimensional breakdown that you had with you know, focus versus unfocused and interactive versus passive was really striking. One of the things that I wondered about um, is how specific that framework is to animated visualizations. So y you talked about the idea that the visualization could be running in the background and then something happens and it sends a user a notification. But there are lots of visualizations where if the user's not interacting, nothing is going to happen. Do you think that this framework still applies in the case of static visualizations? And yeah. if so, how so? So, yeah, definitely there's the data uh, aspect of the, basically we use real-time data, so visualization going to be updated all the time. But not all visualization would have the same uh, data. They might have a stagnant data that's prefixed. Uh, but, so in that, in that sense, maybe uh, applying animated visualization would not be really relevant. However, if as a visualization developer, if you really want users so that they might uh, users to perceive good information without interacting, then you can always have an automatic um, switch view type of uh, feature implemented in the visualization so that even when the user is not actively in interacting with the visualization, they can actually explore the data. Um, I don't know if I answered it very well, but I can talk to you in offline. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks.